If you want to write a book and become a best-selling author, you're in the right place. At Elite Online Publishing, we can help you create, publish, and market your book so that it becomes a number one bestseller. We work with a limited number of authors to ensure that they receive the best possible service. So if you want to learn how to write and publish a book that will empower you to smartly grow your brand, business, and credibility, apply today. We look forward to working with you. Hey everyone, it's Melanie Johnson. I'm here with Jen Foster, my business partner at Elite Online Publishing. And we are talking books, publishing, writing, and we have an icon with us today. I know he doesn't like me to call him an icon, but he is. I'm from Michigan originally, in case you didn't know that. And uh, my whole family are Michigan, University of Michigan people. And Jim Branstetter has been long been the voice of University of Michigan football. But he is also a number one best-selling author. And I know he's very humble, doesn't really need the best bestseller in there, but you know, we're a publishing company. We like to say he's a bestseller because he earned it. And he has written not one, but two books, The Tales of Michigan Stadium, volumes one and two. And he's here to share his experience and his journey writing, publishing, and using his book and his career. Jim, thanks for joining us today. Well, I, th I should be thanking you both because you guys were the ones that uh, helped me in this last effort. And so Elite Online Publishing is, is an all-star and an icon in my book. Uh, because you guys got this last project up and running and uh, we're still running with it and it's going really well. And I really thank you guys. And, and it's great to be with you both. Thanks, Jim. Thanks for being here. Tell us a little bit about your background and how you got into broadcasting and why you wanted an audio book. Well, it's kind of weird. I, you know, when I got out of high school, I was a pretty good football player. And the University of Michigan was one of the colleges that came by and said, hey, would you be interested in playing football here? on a full ride scholarship. Now I, being stupid at 17 years old, I said, you know, even if I don't play and I'm like cannon fodder for the rest of the team, at least I have the ability to get a degree from the University of Michigan and you can't beat that. So it's a win. Plus I'll always be challenged to know whether I could or I couldn't play Big Ten football. And as it turned out, I played quite a bit. Uh, I went to two Rose Bowls. I was a second team all Big Ten selection in my senior year. So that was my football career. And when I graduated, I immediately got a job in the media, which is what I wanted to do. I used to play around in the locker room and do voices like Howard Cosell and Kurt Gowdy and Ray Scott and all these old iconic voices that used to do television and radio sports over the years. And I just kind of parlayed that into a career. I was very lucky, got a job in Saginaw to start, then moved to Jackson, where I met my wife, and then moved to Detroit, and then was able to get to play-by-play, -play, which is really my ultimate love. As I tell people, you watch the 6 and the 11 news, both of you do, where you're from, and there's a guy reading the sports, and he either talks about what has happened, or he reads highlights, or he talks about what's going to happen. I wanted to talk about what was happening right then. And the only way to do that is to be at the event and help the listener or the viewer through the event as it's happening. That to me was the challenge. No script. You got to go with it as it happens. And, and that's where I really wanted to go. And ultimately in 1980, I found a way to get there. I broadcast University of Michigan football as a color analyst and a play-by-play -play voice for 47 years. Awesome. And I was on the Detroit Lions radio network broadcast in the state of Michigan for 31 years. So that's how it happened. And that's how I got to where I am today. And luckily I was able to run into you guys just after I retired so that I could get this book going. And you know, the play-by-play -play, as being a former newscaster myself is way more fun than having to regurgitate the same kind of <laughs> uh, same stories day after day, you know, and the follow-up to this story, if you didn't hear it yesterday, let me give you the background and <laughs> exactly. over again. the play-by-play -play is way more exciting. But you interviewed so many people, not just doing play-by-play. -play. You had the opportunity to interview so many sports greats. And, and then you got inspired to turn that into a book. And why did you want to turn it into a book, even though you had already interviewed them? Well, you know, it almost didn't happen by accident. It was one of those things where it was an evolution. When I wrote the books, Tales from Michigan Stadium, Volumes 1 and Volumes 2, a group came to me and said, hey, You'd be a great one because I've been involved with Michigan football since 1970, well, 68 when I went to school there. Uh -huh. But then at 78, 79, I was started to do their games. And so 
I knew all the players. I met Fritz Chrysler, some of these great iconic names in Michigan football history. They've got buildings named after them, and I met them. You know, that's kind of rare. And so I was able to speak to some of those guys or people who knew them and interview them because of my relationship with Michigan football and doing audio and video for the University of Michigan Athletic Department in recruiting films and in scouting things. I was the voice. I was producing those things. So as that would be known, all of us who have been in broadcasting, you interview somebody, you say that stuff. And I've had it, I had it on cassette tapes, I've had it on mini discs, I had it on all kinds of formats. I threw them in a box and I put them in a garage. So I retired. This is 25 years after I wrote the first two books, which I had interviewed guys and saved the interviews because I needed to quote them properly and I wanted them on tape so I could quote them properly. Well, I retire and I say, I've got all this material. How can I repurpose it? And I listened to some of it and I went, you know what? You've got gold here. I've got the voice of the guy that scored the first touchdown ever at Michigan Stadium back in 1927. Wow. Telling me the story in his own voice. I interviewed him at a Don Cannon party when he was 94 years old. He was lucid and he loved every minute of the story. He told it like it was yesterday. And, and I said, man, I got to be able to use that. So at one point I was saying, you know, I had to put these snippets together and I'll throw them on Facebook and social media. And after I listened to a few of them, I went, you know, this could get bigger. So I went through the whole group of interviews, including Bo Schembechler, Ron Kramer, some of these other guys that I have done. And I said, you know, this could be a book. So I sat down about three or four years ago and started to write the ins and outs of an audio book using their own voices to tell the great historical story of Michigan football. And that's where you guys came in. We were able to work a deal where the audio book and we transcribed all of that stuff into a paperback. So you've got a paperback and an audio book of the voices of Michigan Stadium. And historically, it's an amazing collection. And I'm just hoping Michigan fans and football fans, college football fans across the country have an opportunity because I think it's kind of unique. And many people out there historically that have that kind of material might be interested to listen to it and kind of use their own old audio tapes to create the same kind of historical perspective on a subject of their own. I love that you repurposed what you had. And I love that you kept their voice because that's the joy and the awesomeness of an audiobook is you can have multiple, you can have different actors, different voices. And so to be able to like have your voice, which everyone's used to and hearing all the time, right? right. And then having these guys from, you know, their interviews where whenever they played throughout the years and then having their interview, I think it's just amazing that you can capture all of that and take it and put it into one audiobook. Well, because thank it's, you. It's such a gem for people to listen to. It, it is. And, and part of the deal is, and Melanie knows because she's listened to Michigan football, people recognize me by a voice. Like I'll walk into a bakery and I'll say, give me three of your eclairs. And the guy will look at me and go, how do I know you? He doesn't know me by my face, but he knows the voice. But the beauty, too, of it, Jen, and it goes to your point, like take, for instance, all of us have heard Franklin Delano Roosevelt say, this is a day that will live in infamy, right? Mm -hmm. On After the Japanese uh, attacked Pearl Harbor. When you read that, it's one thing. When you hear him say it on the floor of Congress, it's a whole nother thing. And when you hear Bo Schembechler say, in his own voice, with that intensity, I will never forget that until the day I die. It takes on a whole new meaning and a whole new life. And, and you're so right on that. The audio saving those actual interviews, it brings that whole history to life. And that's why I'm uh, really delighted with it and how it came out. And you know, Jim, you speak all the time, but now you had this new book that came out, the volume two. Did it open up new opportunities where people wanted to interview you because you were coming out with this other book or get other speaking gigs? Oh, ab absolutely. Yeah, oh, absolutely it did. And, and you know what's interesting? It's, it's almost become, you know, you've read that book, The Accidental Tourist. Huh? <laughs> well, I'm like the accidental historian now. And then you want to talk about how, the, how it has changed and new things have happened. I never got into this with the idea that I would be a quote unquote historian 
of Michigan football. And yet, when I've gone out to promote the book at different alumni functions or things, and people will call you and ask you because they would love to get the book. And I've taken some paperbacks and signed them and told them to buy the audio book and all the other stuff. But I will say to them in the audience, some of them, I said, how many of you guys remember Tom Harmon? And there are some people in the audience that don't remember him. This is an iconic, unbelievable, foundational, generational name in Michigan sports and Michigan football. And there are some people out there that don't remember him. Well, it has now fallen on me, I think, because of publishing this book, yeah. to kind of remind people of the history of Michigan football and that Fielding HOs, that Fritz Chrysler, uh, Benny Oosterbahn are not just names on buildings. They were actual living, breathing people who performed for the University of Michigan and who were athletes who are the foundation upon which we all stand and uh, are part of the Michigan tradition. So that's kind of the interesting new thing that has happened just because of the book. And in a way, I've become this accidental University of Michigan football historian a little bit. So it's been fun on a couple of levels. That's really good because not only are you let, leaving their legacy and letting it live on, live now, but you're also, you know, being able to share it with everyone in a print form and audio form and leaving your legacy at the same time. It's and kind of like that. Yeah, it, <laughs> it's funny. Yeah, it, it, you know, I never thought in my lifetime I would ever think of being a quote unquote educator. But Jen, your question is perfect because that's kind of what it's become. Mm -hmm. uh, from an author, I've now kind of morphed into this educator or historian where I'm letting younger people know, look, take a look back. You know, Google Tom Harmon, you know, Google <laughs> Ron Kramer, Google Ron Johnson and some of these other guys. I mean, if I'm even, we are so involved with me, social media and the 24 hour news cycle and that kind of thing that happens and the informational kind of era we are in, it changes. I, you know, something a week old is now a hundred years old. Yeah. And, and I just think people now need to look back and take a little more perspective and see history in a different way. And if I'm the guy that has to tell them about it, then so be it. I'll be glad to do it. Because if we forget those names and we forget that tradition and the foundation that we're built on, then we're standing on sand. And that's not a good thing for any of us. So true. And, you know, I always tell authors like they want to know the ROI and some of it's unpredictable because you don't know this unexpected door that's going to open or how you're going to be perceived. And that's what happened to you. Um, and I'm sure like one of the tips we always tell our authors when you get these speaking gigs, it's like, OK, you're going to hire me to speak. Uh, would you like books for everyone in the audience? Oh, yes, I would. OK, well, we'll order those for you and have them sent. And so you have them or you want them for your goodie bags everyone's giving away that you're including those books there, or they want you to sign books in the back of the room, which is also cool. All right, I wanna get into the ugly part, right? The, the <laughs> painful part. Not the ugly part, but you know, you know, writing a book isn't always easy, putting everything together. And I know there were times you were just like, ah, you know, this is harder than I thought. So we want people to know that it's not all, you know, roses and sugar plums when they do this, it is a process. And then there's a process after the book comes out, you have to keep up with marketing and doing all the work. Talk about that a little bit, the struggles, but then, you know, how it all came out for you. The way I look at it is it's a job. <laughs> you know, it, 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 it's fun to be an author. It's fun to have your, you know, by Jim Branstad or by whomever. You know, by, you know, by Jen Foster, by Melanie Johnson, all this stuff. It's fun to see your name in print. But before it gets there, it's a job. And part of the job is the, I like to call it like an offensive lineman. You got to get out of the huddle, get to the line of scrimmage, make your block, make sure you get your job done, then get back and do it again and do it again and be consistent. And the details are what ultimately get you in, in the far, part of the job thing. And it's about reading over your script or your text and making sure it sounds exactly what you want to do. And you're going to have get a different set of eyes on it because you need to have a different set of eyes say, no, you should do this because that doesn't do this. And you look at it and go, no, you're crazy. You're stupid. I wrote it. It's fine. And then when you look back and you go, yeah, maybe you could, you know, I could touch that up a little. So that's the job part. But, but take that advice use it and create the best possible product you can. And, and then for our book, it was interesting because 
the audio is so important. We wanted it to be an audio book first and foremost. And yet, because of publishing issues, we had to create a paper book, paperback. So we, we did the deal with that and we got this AI thing that you could send it through there and it would transcribe it. And Jen, you were involved in this big yeah. thing. It would transcribe some proper names like Oosterbahn, which <laughs> is a big name at the University of Michigan, but any AI wouldn't know. And you should have seen the different combinations of Oosterbahn we got from this thing. <laughs> it was hilarious. But again, that's part of the job. You got to fix that. Make sure you go through every word from that, transcribe it. So the book that's written is the same as the book that is basically on audio. But the beauty of this audio is different. I'm not narrating the whole thing. You got the actual people that you know created this history at Michigan Stadium telling their story. And that's kind of the unique part of the book. But you're right, Melanie, it's a job. And it's the hard work, it's the practice. It's, you know, the book is Saturday game day. And everything to get it to game day is Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, when you're practicing, that's hard because there ain't anybody watching. You know, there's nobody patting you on the back. It's about getting better so that on game day, you're ready to play in front of TV audiences. And that's kind of what I think your question is like. If you can liken it to football or liken it to any sport, you got to practice in order to be good. This is one of the things I use in my speeches. If you really want to be good at something, if you look at Tiger Woods or you look at somebody who's really good, what you haven't seen is when the camera wasn't on and they were out practicing on a practice range or doing something for eight hours yeah. and getting blisters on their hands and their feet and everything else just to get to the point where they could be that way. And that's what the preparation is to get the book published. It is hard work, but the rewards are exceptional. And I uh, advise and uh, uh, urge anyone who has the itch to do that, go ahead and scratch it. <laughs> you know, I love that about the work. It's the practice. You have this whole yeah. practice to get up to the game. And I always equate when they work with us, hey, you know, your book is like the first play in a football game. When you're working with us, we're going to kick it into the end zone. You're going to score on the first play by becoming a bestseller. And then the goal is to keep you like on the 20 yard line. So you feel like you still have that momentum going. So I'm going to use in the, and, but before that, guess what? We're on the practice field. So I'm stealing that. Exactly practice. right. No, you're right. I mean, that's the way it is. That's the way I felt about it is like, this is about practice. Cause when I played at Michigan, Bo Schembechler was my coach. And he says in the book, we have as many, yeah, you're getting me going here on the book, but he says in the book as part of his, I have a section in the book called Bo in his own words. And he says in the book, because I asked him one question about, you know, the histrionics and the pregame speeches and the halftime speeches where supposedly it was rumored that he peeled paint off the walls and he got after his team and yelled at him and made him and motivated him. And he said, that's all crazy. I never did that. If you don't get ready to play on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, anything you say on Saturday is not going to work. Mm -hmm. And it, it's, he says it right in the book. So that analogy is perfect. And if you don't do your work on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, uh, Saturday's not going to be as successful as you want it to be. Do you have any tips for authors listening or writers listening on how you disciplined yourself and not procrastinated to get some of that work done? Again, I think the analogy is make it a job. You do, yeah. you, when you go to work. Set you, a time. You, yeah, you go to work at 8 o'clock or 9 o'clock. You, know, you don't have to have a time. If you want to work overnight, that's fine. But map out four hours, wherever it is. If it's 10 in the morning till 2 in the afternoon and take a break till 3, and then go 3 to 5, do it. But map it out. Do it. When you schedule your week up, don't set a luncheon on a day that you have, quote, unquote, a work day. Mm -hmm. you're working at home usually from your computer when you're writing a book and so that's all I would do is just say have the self-discipline to say this is my job this is a work day and set a time I mean there were times that I worked you know from 10 at night until two in the morning because I'm kind of a night owl that way but I found those to be most productive because the phone didn't ring there was nobody emailing me all the things that we have to deal with today in today's world the communications aspect of our all, all of our lives, usually it slows down after 10 o'clock at night. 
And, and I found that to be for me. Now, for somebody else, it's different. But for me, from 10 to 2 in the morning, that's a four-hour stretch where I was able to really concentrate and have a lot of time to myself where I didn't have anything getting in my way. And I'm telling you, you guys know this, both of you are authors. When you get into it and you're rolling, that time flies. You look at your watch and go, holy crap, it's 1.30 and you only think like you've been there for an hour and a half. And yet you've been there three and a half hours. Yeah. So, and you know what you were really great at is following for our deadlines. And I think having those deadlines versus like, oh, I'm going to write this book whenever I get it done. But if you're signed up and you're working with the team, whether it's your publisher and your other secret weapon, I'm going to shout out Kathleen Stevens. Oh, Kathleen. She's more than a secret weapon. She's a nuclear weapon. She's (laughs) nuclear fission. That's who she is. She's Don't push that button because we'll all get blown up. (laughs) But she provided accountability that she's a member of your team that helps it, the accountability. And you had us all together to make sure you had timelines, deadlines of when you knew you had to get things out versus just this arbitrary thing of someday, some way I'll do this. So it really set it up for you. I think that's important for an author. And and, and that's the thing. You got to put a, you put a goal out there. You say, I want to be done with this by such and such a time, or I want to meet this deadline. You can't do that if you say, oh, I got to do that a week from now, because it's not going to happen. Mm-hmm. You've got to get something done every day, something done every day. Mm-hmm. Just some of the things I'm doing now on social media to, to promote the book again on my website, and on my Facebook pages. I've got little, again, pictures of players with m- m- little quotes from players. And I've got a little, and it, I do it on my own computer and a little PowerPoint thing but I put slides up and it has a quote and it has excerpt from voices of Michigan stadium available at Amazon and Jim And I just put it on a Facebook page, but I've been doing that now. And I've got like five or six of them already out. And I've got six or seven sitting on my desktop waiting to be thrown out there uh, as, as we go forward. But you, you do something, you set aside a day. It's like, again, I talked about hours you set aside two hours in your day and say, oh, this is my promotion for Voices of Michigan Stadium. I need an hour. What do I want to do? I want to do this. So you do some of that stuff. Put it, how easy on a computer. You can put it on a flash drive. You can do whatever. Save it. But then ultimately, when you need to go use it, you just plug it in wherever you want to plug it in. So that's kind of, the deadlines are important, but I'm always the one that likes to be well ahead of the deadline and be ahead of the game because, <laughs> Maybe I know about Murphy's Law better than everybody because usually something's going to go wrong. So if you give yourself a little bit of slop time at the, at the tail end, you can fix what went wrong in that slop time and still be on time. Does that make sense? Yeah, it totally. Does. And it's <laughs> the continuous marketing that you're doing. So some authors are like, okay, my book's up. I'm just going to let Amazon do it for me. But you know the name of the game is continuously promoting it, continuously using it and putting it out there and sending it to people. Absolutely. No, I mean, hey, I, this book is about Michigan football, right? Well, we last year, I think, published sometime in late November, mid-November, I think, is when we finally got the book out, the audio and the paperback. And the football season was two months over. So I've got another football season coming up. So why not lead in to that football season mm-hmm. with more stuff about Voices from Michigan Stadium? Because not everybody's bought it yet. I want everybody to have it. I want everybody to have that history lesson that I've gotten, that I've had, and I think they'll enjoy it. I, a little quick anecdote, I was just at the dentist's office the other day, yesterday. I mean, I this is weird. I was at the dentist's office yesterday. I had a crown pop off. He put it back on. He was telling me about he's going down to visit his daughter who's in school in Savannah. And I said, oh, that'll be a great drive. Savannah's a beautiful place. And I said, yeah, it is. We've been there a number of times. And he says, yeah, I'm looking for, I got to drive down there. And I said, then he asked me what I was doing. I told him I wrote an audio book. He said, you did? I said, yeah. I said, you ought to get that and and plan on your drive to Savannah. Because he's a Michigan guy. He said, what a great idea. And so there's one more book sold, you know, but he'll tell his friends and he'll tell his friends. But all of that is part of the, the deal. And all summer long, I intend through my own social media, whether it's Twitter, I have a Twitter account and my Facebook page and on my website, I will have certain little things to get the book, excerpts of the book in front of those eyes 
And if they haven't seen it and they do, and they buy one, that leads into the fall when we can maybe do a few more different radio shows or different things in the media where I can, you know, maybe have a second push as a preseason thing for Michigan football, as opposed to the end of the season when we launched last year. Mm -hmm. Well, I think football fans, any football fan would love listening to it. I appreciate it. I, I think it's cool. I really do. I think it, it, any football fan would like to, because it's about collegiate football yeah. and some of the great names in collegiate football. And so if you're interested in Michigan football, you're interested in college football, interested in Big Ten football, you actually hear those voices. And as you're driving down the road or you're listening to it, you kind of smile to hear those stories. Those You were in the stadium when something happened and you actually hear the guy tell you about what was going through his mind when it happened. When Desmond Howard caught that touchdown pass against Notre Dame on a play that wasn't supposed to be that play. And he and his coach tell you that, well, Notre Dame did this. They rolled into a different coverage, and I thought they were going to throw this pass. Well, Desmond ran the wrong route. And Desmond says, I saw the guy jump up, and I said, I can get behind him. Elvis and threw the ball. This is the stuff fans love to hear about because it's the stories that they hear. You never are in the locker room to hear the story. This book takes you in the locker room to hear the real story from the real player. And that's what I like about it. I can almost see this book visually, like as you're telling me about the interviews, because everything gets turned into, like I could see the voices going in the background of the interviews, right? With clips of the things they're oh, yeah. talking about or of the player and make it like a documentary, I think. So I'm seeding that out in the universe that your audiobook should become a documentary. <laughs> oh, that would be, that'd be great. I, I always like to say my job as a play-by-play -play voice was <laughs> to paint the picture Mm -hmm. Oh, because that was on radio when I did my work, okay? But yeah. think about this. You go to games in the stadium, right? You've been to games in the stadium. Yeah. So wherever you sit, if I say interception, he's running down right in front of the Michigan bench. He's headed toward the goal line where the American flag is, and he gets over the end zone. You know exactly where you are. If your seat was across the way, you'd know he was on the opposite side of the field. So I try to, with that description – transport you to that spot and so you can visualize it even though you're on the radio because let's face it everybody your mind is a better movie projector than any movie projector ever invented uh -huh. and you can imagine things in your mind and, and and what it looks like a lot better than the reality of it so that's why hearing these voices you have your own picture and image of Bo Schembechler or Ron Kramer or those old stadium pictures, those old days. And you can visualize it and, and the voice just takes you to the next spot. I'll never, one of the great things is that it, it, Michigan is as wonderful an institution as it is, didn't have female cheerleaders until 1976. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, doesn't that sound like backwards? Well, <laughs> but it was, it, that's the truth. They only had male gymnasts and in the first year they did it, Don Canham's daughter, Claire, was one of the first female cheerleaders. And that's one of the stories in the book. She talks about how they wouldn't call them cheerleaders. They officially labeled them as pom-pom girls. They wouldn't allow them to be cheerleaders. They couldn't cheer with the guys at the same time. Really? These were, And there were op-ed pieces written in the Ann Arbor News about it. You talk about how far we've come, but that story from Claire is unbelievable. And she was on that first squad. And that's part of the history of Michigan football too, which we discuss in the book. So your image, that got my image going about Claire with their little outfits. And when the first women cheerleaders were allowed to actually cheer at Michigan Stadium, it was kind of cool. Well, I love everything you're doing with your book. I love that you're, it's opened up that you're now a historian, that you didn't expect to have it, that you've got new media attention that uh, started all over again because of this book, new speaking opportunities because of all of it, and becoming such a historian and inspiring us to repurpose content. Go back oh, and find absolutely. that you have. I mean, there's stuff that everybody has in their garage. And, yeah. and just use your imagination. If you're a writer, isn't that what we all do? Isn't that what we all have? 
So I think probably to check out there and see what you got, your own personal experiences, your own little, even your journals. I mean, I had somebody come up to me, talk about doing things. I always take journals when we travel with the family, do stuff of where we went and what we saw. And uh, somebody said, you got to take those journals and make them into a book. And I'm kind of thinking, well, maybe one of these days <laughs> I'll, I'll go check those out and see what I wrote, see what we did in Hawaii in, back in 1980 or something like that, you know? And write a book called Travels with Jim and Robbie. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> if I do, I'm calling you guys. <laughs> <laughs> well, tell us where you people can go to find you and to get your book. People can go find uh, the book at uh, jimbrandstetter.com. It's really easy because uh, right on the opening homepage is a little button you can click that says buy the audio book here, buy the paperback here. Click it and it takes you right to the Amazon page where you can order the book. So any Amazon, any Amazon is a good place to go to. Just search Voices of Michigan Stadium by Jim Brandstetter or go to jimbrandstetter.com. And it'll be there. And I, I guarantee you'll like it. It's a nice listen and it's a wonderful read. And where can they find you if they want to hire you to speak? Same thing. Go to jimbrandstander.com. You've got a, a contact you page back there. And uh, Kathleen and I will figure out what, what whether I'm doing. Being retired, I'm trying to back away from some of this busy, crazy stuff and uh, driving all over to do this. That's what, hey, I retired to get out of that stuff, Melanie. What are you doing? You're throwing me out there again. To the wolves. Stop I am. It. You're the busiest retired guy we know. And we you know I got to stop this. My wife's killing me. She says, oh, you can't do that this week. We got to go over here. And I went, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for being on the show. We appreciate it, Jim. And if you're looking to publish your book, repurpose your content, come up with content that you have in your head, we're the place to go. Contact us at Elite Online Publishing. Hit the author submission button. We'll see if you're a good fit for us. Have a great week, everyone. Bye. Bye. And thank you, everybody. If you want to write a book and become a best-selling author, you're in the right place. At Elite Online Publishing, we can help you create, publish, and market your book so that it becomes a number one bestseller. We work with a limited number of authors to ensure that they receive the best possible service. So if you want to learn how to write and publish a book that will empower you to smartly grow your brand, business, and credibility, apply today. We look forward to working with you.